Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges, and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Scott Luton and Kim Mortar here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome, Kim. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Always a good day when we're at Supply Chain Now. Wonderful. I completely agree. We've got a wonderful show teed up once again. Looking forward to your practitioner color commentary, which is going to be really good here. So, folks, today we're diving into peak season prep, right? Hopefully you've already been there, done that, and well down that path. We're going to be talking with a few been there, done that business leaders and gaining their perspective on how you can help your organization more successfully navigate peak season 2024. Kim, should be a great show, huh? Yeah, it's never too early to talk about peak season, so perfect timing. Perfect timing. That's right. And timing, it ain't everything, but it's a <laughs> it's a lot of it, right? It's a lot. <laughs> uh, if folks enjoy today's show, we hope you do. There's a money back guarantee. Uh, be sure to share. <laughs> be sure to share it with a friend or your network. They'll be glad you did. Am I right, Kim? Yes. Yes. All right. So, Kim. Let's get to work. Let's welcome in our two featured guests back by popular demand, starting with Wes Arnson, Manager of Logistics Sales with SPS Commerce, and his colleague, Tony Thrasher, Senior Director of Product Management with SPS. All right, Wes, how you doing? Good. How you doing, Scott? Wonderful. Great to have you back. Tony, how you doing? Good to see you all again. Doing well. You as well. Now, we I really enjoyed personally, and we got a lot of feedback from across our global, our incredibly smart global audience and community that they really enjoyed our last show, really enjoyed the interactions between Kim, Wes, and Tony and folks. So we're bringing another installment. Got a lot of stuff to get into here today. A little fun warm-up question, folks. A little history for you. You know, I'm a big old history nerd. On this day, did you know? On this day, June 11th, back in 1978, Texas Instruments introduced the Speak and Spell, an electronic educational toy for kids that went on to be a really popular device in the 1980s. It's been said, though, Kim, Wes, and Tony, that this device was the first ever to feature a duplication of the human voice on a single chip of silicon. My brother and I had one of these. My sister, I think, was of age, too. And we wore this thing slap out. You know, we're, we speak Southern English, so we we're trying to learn how to speak proper English. But all, all of that, I'm from South Carolina, I can say that. All of that to say, I'd like to get each of y'all to share one of your favorite toys growing up that's inseparable from your childhood. And Tony, you're nodding your head. I know what you're thinking. You go first. All right. Favorite toys. I'm going to go action figure route. Okay. I would say kind of heyday the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So I would have had probably every variation of those action figures paired up in some type of scheme against probably Batman action figures. Oh, I love it. it. Leonardo. Proper. <laughs> yep. Yep. Right. Leonardo was my favorite. The swords, right? Uh, out of the four Mutant Ninja Turtles. Wes, that's going to be a tough one to top. We're starting in a good one. Wes? Yeah, hands down, it's it's uh, Legos. We we grew up. I got a couple of brothers. We spent a lot of time putting together things. I don't think we followed the directions. It was kind of making our own worlds out of Legos. It was a lot of fun. Oh, I love it. And I tell you, Legos since that time, hadn't they done a great job marketing and cross branding all that stuff as they're taking over the universe? That's a good one, Wes. Mm -hmm. Kim. All right, so we got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We got Legos. What about you? All right. Well, first, just a small disclosure. Um, I still Lego today. It's a great stress reliever. As you said, Scott, Legos have come a long way. They're still going. <laughs> um, but my favorite toy as a child would have to be my Barbie doll convertible car. Oh, um, man. There you go. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful, gorgeous pink. I had the little safety bar on the back just in case uh, you rolled it. But that was my absolute favorite. We had hundreds of miles with that with that convertible. Love it. And back in the 80s, you got about two miles to the gallon, I think, right? We've come a little, little the way, gas right? was like 50 cents, so it wasn't That's so bad. 
That's so true, man. All right. I love the flashbacks, Kim, Wes, and Tony. we got to have to have a whole series dedicated. A whole thing this. about that. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> uh, so I want to start, though, with level setting with a little bit of context. I referenced you know, me and Kim hosted Wes and Tony a few weeks ago. Got a, a lot of great feedback about that conversation. So let's just remind folks, Wes, if you would, tell us briefly what SPS Commerce does and a little bit of your background. Sure thing. So SPS Commerce, we help connect the retail supply chain. So whether that's retailers sending purchase orders to their vendors, three BLs that get involved in that, whether that's moving goods, storing, pick, pack, and shipping goods, SPS sits at the, the middle of that and, and help facilitate the data transfer between all those parties. Um, I specifically uh, lead a, a team that focuses on the logistics side of it. So that's carriers, warehouses, third-party logistics of any sort. That, that's the group we're focused on. So you might hear a, a lens on that today, but you know Tony is very well versed in, in the vendor side. So we'll be touching on that as well. Love it. I think blessed are the connectors is one of the Beatitudes, if I'm not mistaken, Wes. And I love the role y'all played there across the retail world. Tony, tell us a little about your background. Yeah. So uh, 15 plus years of experience in retail supply chain, you know, in the space that, that Wes really articulated most of that with SBS Commerce, but you know, working with logistics providers, brands, manufacturers that are shipping into distributors or retailers, you know, working with kind of all of those parties, kind of key players in the retail supply chain. Love that. And, you know, Kim, we don't tout this enough. I think it's important for our audience. You've got a, a deep background when it comes to supply chain and especially retail supply chain. Mm -hmm. Quick blurb about that for uh, context. Oh, yeah. So everything we're talking about now, you know, I spent four years at Nordstrom uh, headquarters out in Seattle, helping with sort of a supply chain uh, lift and change, lift and fit, as we sort of called it back then. And this is crucial. You know, one of the craziest things for me, I came from Amazon, seven years at Amazon, doing e-commerce and e-commerce supply chain and coming and doing retail supply chain was a little bit mind blowing, right? Because we're not talking about well, the time way back in the day, like Amazon had like 12 warehouses and now we have like 80. You know, when you get into retail, it's like all the stores and the warehouses and the, you know, and we got to go into like downtown New York and the timing and everything that needs to happen with the retail perspective. It's just as complex, if not a little bit more complex than e-commerce. Yes. Yes. And getting the friction out, getting the complexity out. Right. It doesn't mean this business is simple, but how can we make it as simple as possible for mm -hmm. our team, uh, as simple and positive as possible for our, our customers out there, our suppliers out there, the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be talking all of that, especially as it applies to peak season um, here today. So, mm -hmm. Tony, yeah, going back to you here, now that we've kind of level set around a lot of things here, including all three of you and your backgrounds and what you do. Uh, let's get your observations for peak season 2024. I got a two-part question for you. First, what are some of the typical dynamics involved in this peak and any peak? And then secondly, what are some of the more unique elements this season? Excellent. So I'm going to maybe Kim riff off of what the two categories you were just touching on. I'm going to just speak a little bit more about like, let's say wholesale retail peak season. And then also then just come back to that e-commerce that, that that is certainly a big part of this. But, you know, if you look at the wholesale distribution calendar, really what, what we see is July and August. So we're pretty close, right? July and August right. is when those initial shipments are really, you're going to see those surges of initial shipments to get goods populated into retailer distribution centers. And that's going to really kind of peak out in that September timeline where retailers probably have the most inventory in their distribution center. Then they start proliferating that out to their stores through October, November, and December with those replenishment goods coming from their supplier community kind of sustained and reactive to overall buying trends that season as well. So that's just an important piece is like we're really kind of getting to some of the peak season, if you will, already on that, that wholesale side, especially when you go upstream in the supply chain, start talking about manufacturers producing their goods, then shipping into a distribution center on the wholesale side. So like, it is easy for us to talk a lot about e-commerce and that's obviously very important here. And I'll get to that in a moment, but that's an important uh, thing to remember as well. And then then you have e-commerce in general, which, which we know is gonna be pulling from those inventories in DC, pulling from inventories at the, at the brands all over the place in 3PL warehouses, 
that we know all too well is going to be a November, December return season in January type of a mode. Uh, in terms of your second question, Scott, like what yeah. maybe some of the unique elements that we're expecting? We touched on this the last time we joined you all, the e-commerce growth. Like it's going to grow, but there's still that like, let's say, slowness and acceleration over our e-commerce growth. So like you, you wouldn't expect, I don't think we're expecting to see just these giant leaps of e-commerce relative year over year, but there is going to be right. sustained growth there, which is important to prepare for. I think the shopping season continues to extend, you know, even if all of us can just relate to probably our shopping experiences. And I think retailers continue to be super savvy and how they promote and things that they do in the store to extend those and almost take some of the burden off themselves to just be isolated to a certain few days or certain peaks. So expect that trend to continue. And then the last one is, you know, I think our cost, our consumer expectations, us as consumers has continued to evolve. I think there's an interesting dynamic with just increased prices. I think we're all going to spend more than we have. And I think that is going to push us to expect just a little bit more service from a shipping perspective, a more personalized experience in the store and outside of the store. So I, you know, those are kind of trends that continue, but maybe a little bit of nuance for this season kind of married up with that calendar view. Tony, I appreciate that. Two quick points for our good Kim for her take on, on what you're saying, sharing there. Uh, in, inflation is at 3%, I believe, last count. And we wanted at 2%, at least here in the state. So we'll see the continued, hopefully, good work of getting that down so we don't pay more or at least not as much. We want the product on the shelves when the customer is ready to make that transaction. Mm -hmm. So, Kim, anything you want to add about those peak season, unique and traditional dynamics that Tony was talking about? I think it's going to be an interesting season. Um, you know, what I'm hearing out in the market is that consumers are going back to stores. They want to have that experience. They are not necessarily spending money in stores, but they're going to stores. They're checking stuff out. And most of them are then making a purchase online later or making a purchase while they're in the store online for a variety of reasons. Don't have my size, whatever it is. So I think, you know, even more like Omnichannel has been a big topic for, you know, 10, 15 years now, especially right. for big retailers. Yep. I think we're just going to continue to see more complexity around that. Because one of the things that happened, helped with Omnichannel was that the store presence was down, right? So customers weren't expecting so much out of the stores. It was more like an online play. But now as customers are swinging back, they're going to expect that full experience in a retail location. The tolerance for, oh, we only have these two sizes is continuing to kind of drop. So that puts a lot of pressure on inventory management, 3PL management, predictability, distribution of inventory, it's just going to become more and more complex as consumers uh, want it all everywhere. Want it all everywhere. Don't we all want that? Because we're all consumers, practitioners, but certainly consumers as well. Good stuff there, Kim. Okay, want to keep driving here. Wes, I'm going to turn to you. We want to really dive in on this next segment of our conversation here today and gain you and Tony's and Kim's expertise and experience to help business leaders out there better navigate, more successfully navigate this upcoming peak season. Uh, so Wes, let's start with what measures can you take to maintain service quality, which is really important, meeting those customer expectations, even when the demand is high. Wes? I think like we talked about earlier, it, it starts long ahead of any peak season. And it really boils down to, I think, you know, peak season puts a magnifying glass in whatever you're doing. You know, we like Tony talked about, we see the the volumes, you know, we see kind of random spikes that that maybe in the past we didn't see off peak season due to yeah. you know, maybe uh, trends or just sales. So I think we talked about this last time a lot. It's it comes out of automation, yeah, at least from our perspective, because there's only so many people you can throw at a problem in peak season and be able to get through it. I mean, we've I've heard stories of that from from folks I've worked with where they, they had a much bigger Q4 than they projected, or they had a right. peak earlier than they expected. They didn't have what they needed to support that. And that just created a ton of troubles with retailers because they didn't meet the requirements and suddenly they're seeing chargebacks. They're seeing a lot of things. So to me, it's, it's automation. It's spending time early in the season, 
running simulations, running, you know, tests to see, can, can we keep up with capacity if we were to get up, you know, to a certain level, Tony can speak to this more, but we, we do the same thing from a data perspective. We're pushing data through our network at a level that is far above what we expect to see because we want to make sure that everything's in place and there's not something we're going to run into later in the year. So it's, it's spending the time early, even if it's, you know, maybe above and beyond what you expect, but to ensure that no matter what happens, you're prepared, you're, you're not caught off guard, um, trying to find people that you can just quick get in from temp. It's how can we support as much of this as possible with the people who really know our operation. Mm -hmm. Love that Wes. Uh, let's see here. Automation, getting out ahead, lots of simulations, not just throwing a lot of folks at it. We got to lean into technology, doing things differently. What else did you hear there, Kim? What else would you add? So planning early, I think, is the biggest thing, right? And the other uh, kind of playing on what Wes was talking about, a another thing that I see is that companies don't plan, period. And then they get in trouble and exactly what Wes just said. Then all of a sudden they're running around. They're like, oh, my God, what do we do? So first and foremost, you should have a set peak metrics that you measure, right? Inbound, open POs. What do we have on our inbound? What are we expecting? Uh, sto, it's not just about getting it in the door. We got to get it into a, a sellable location. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, is the outbound stuff. And every good company should have a set level, a set number of 3PLs or a set uh, 3PL metric that are a, a metric that they measure at, at peak season all the time. And they're looking at it all the time. And what I see is that companies don't do that. Yeah. And then when it does hit the fan, they're like, well, we don't know where to get it. Nobody's looking at it. And then all of a sudden around, I don't know, Thanksgiving generally, there's some big epiphany because we finally did look at the data and we're like, oh, crap. So plan early and then define your metrics that you want to use for the peak seasons. To be totally honest, you should be using them all year long. But if you want to do it around peak season and use them and use them consistently all the time. Yeah. And Kim, share them with all of your suppliers and make sure they understand how they're being measured. That'd be a great idea, right? So, Tony, before I move to the next question, we've covered a lot of ground just in this one question with Wes. Anything you want to add in, Tony, before I move to the next one? No, I, I, I like those concepts. Completely agree with that. It. It's taking the time. And we like in from a calendar perspective, it's the folks that do this well have a rhythm yes. immediately exiting last peak season. So, exactly. like in your yep. point, prepare have a plan, make sure you have the right plan at the right time too. So you have enough time to react to that plan or what, yes. what you, what you learned from the last season too. So we might be a little yeah. late for that this year, but obviously if that's not something you're doing, you should be earmarking that for January, February, March next year. That's right. Mm -hmm. Hey, while you're working on peak season this year, right? To your point, Tony, we're already where we are. We can't change that, but track those observations you're learning in year. So your next. 2025 conversation, as you really get up to Wes's point, get out ahead of it, you can apply it early next year. And as Wes said, basically a paraphrasing, spend time early so you can enjoy the time you spend later in the year, right? Because you're more successful. Um, okay. Next question. Tony, to stick with you for a second. How do you balance this ongoing balance? I'll tell you what, it just goes with the territory. How do you balance the need to meet increased demand, what we're talking about a second ago, with maintaining operational efficiency and cost effectiveness. And by the way, Tony, for your answer, I was looking at data uh, earlier this week from a survey of 375 procurement executives. And guess what their number one priority is for the first time in three years? Cutting costs, cutting costs. Mm -hmm. So Tony, how do you find that balance? I think it's it starts with that first piece, which is understanding where you're expecting that increase in demand to come from, ah. right? So you have to use our you know third party warehouse kind of centering here in the conversation. Your demand is going to come from your customers, and then their demand is going to come from the end consumer, the retailer, the grocer, et cetera, who are their customers. So really understanding that. And we concept that we hear so often from, you touched on this, Kim, that all of these kind of players in the retail supply chain are up against is that concept around inventory allocation. So as a third party warehouse, understanding your customer's allocation strategy and where their priorities and demand are gonna come from is extremely important. Because obviously you wanna do the operational efficiencies, the cost cutting, 
but still meeting that demand appropriately, right? And that's going to kind of feed into your prioritization in the next couple of months as you're getting ready, last minute preparation. But I think that that is the really good three PLs, third party warehouses that I know Wes and I speak with on a regular basis obsess over their customer's business as if it's their own. And they know their customer strategies and allocation strategies with inventory, what they're trying to get out of the upcoming seasons, as well sometimes, if not better than most of the people at that particular customer's business. So mm -hmm. it's just a really uh, important, important point there. I love it, Tony. And to put it in highly scientific terms, know the things, right? Know where the demand's coming from. Wes, yeah, I think you got an example maybe to Tony's uh, response there to share. Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting we've seen over the years. So like I, I've been here almost 10 years. When I started walking through warehouses, there were, it was just racking in boxes, especially in the, the 3PL space, the third-party warehouse space. You know, certainly if you're a manufacturer, you've had automation for years. But increasingly, there's been more and more focus on automation. As we look at how do I increase my service levels, get more product out the door, we see more and more automation in areas where it didn't make sense before. Because as a third-party warehouse, I got to be prepared for anybody who walks through the door, whatever product they want me to ship. And that means I can't, there's certain types of automation that don't work because I don't know exactly the size of the product. I don't know the shape. I don't know the requirements because I don't make those requirements. My customer does. But more and more, we're starting to see some of the robotics options be flexible enough to be able to handle sort of anything that is thrown at it. There's there's some more complex sortation, you know, ASRS, starting to see more and more of that bubble into these third-party warehouses that I think is going to make a big impact on this when we talk about how do you how do you scale up without scaling up cost. So whether that's mm -hmm. robotics as a service, you know, something that you start to hear more and more where, hey, I can take on, you know, some robots during peak that Yes, there's a cost, but it's not the same as traditional manual labor and be able to scale more efficiently as long as you're building the operation correctly to support those robotics. And again, in advance, going back to what we talked about earlier. Yep. Kim, your thoughts there? Everything that Tony said, basically, um, I have been in so many positions where we've actually gotten a 3PL on the phone, finally with the right people in the company, like the actual buyers, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, there's like all these light bulbs that come on. And the 3PL is, is in many cases, educating them on how to manage their inventory in the physical sense, right? It's not just spreadsheets and what's going to sell through the store. But hey, there's a reality here of we, we're not going to be able to handle a 1,040 footers or sweaters. So we need to think about this differently. So I would always encourage 3PLs, um, you are the experts in the industry. You really should take opportunities to educate your customer. It will make everybody's life better. Yes, it will. Good stuff there, Kim and Wes. Um, all right, so Tony, this is not going to shock anybody. Flexibility is key, folks. It still is. It was 100 years ago. It still is now. Maybe even more flexibility, perhaps because of the ever-evolving, ever-evolving consumer demand. So anticipating those things that will go wrong, but ensuring all parties are in sync to mitigate that snowball effect. Man, there's a premium on that, right? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts when it comes to breaking out the crystal ball, predicting where things may go crazy, and maintaining that powerful orchestration amongst all the parties, Tony? Yeah, I think that's, the, that's always the challenging variable this time of the year because you – you expect the unexpected. We'll probably get into this a little later as well, but like even when we're as a business planning for the holiday season is we know the window of time that we're going to see our peaks peak, but we also don't know exactly when it's going to hit, right? So you've got to be ready and flexible for when you're going to, especially on those e-commerce, like each picks and some of that stuff, you, you've got to be ready to respond. And then that continued transparency, we talked about the transparency through the plan with your customer, but that transparency through the season, you know, like weekly check-ins, how are things going, anything that you're seeing on your side. I think putting some of that infrastructure, quick 15 minute check-in with the right business leader on how things are going, what we're seeing so far, are we expecting to see anything differently? I think those are really good ways of just keeping the open lines of communication and then making sure pulling in the right people at the right time if you do see a disruption. You know, after yes. having those trusted partners, your brand working with 3PL, maybe of multiple 3PLs, 
you know, maybe you're working with a technology provider like SBS Commerce and stuff can go bump in the night there. So, you know, making sure you're bringing in the right parties when the unexpected does happen as well, the remedy. So, Tony, I, just one quick blurb here. Let's, let's communicate when things are great, when things are so-so, and when things are, of course, when they're not going well. Let's increase those communication cadences. It's amazing what you can learn on those good days when folks aren't expecting a call. Kim, your thoughts on Tony's response there? I agree. Flexibility is key, but you have to have data. You have to be flexible about something, right? So a lot of people are like, hey, we're super flexible, but we have no idea. We're just flexing. Uh, we don't know which direction we're going. We're not really sure. Uh, we're just doing, you know, handsprings all the time, but it's not actually productive. So you have to have your data, your predictive data. So we don't we want to look at what happened yesterday. We want to look at what's happening in the future. And then that's where you can really use good technology to be flexible, to make the right decisions, redirect the inventory before it gets to the warehouse. You know, we're going to shift our bikinis from Chicago to Miami because they're just not selling in, in February. But you have to have all of that data before you can make those decisions and then be able to execute on it. So, yes, flexibility, but you got to have something to be flexible about. Good stuff there, Kim. So, Wes, building your support network, right? Critical. What are the critical questions, though, to ask to make sure you're prepared when inevitably things go wrong? Wes? I, I think... Like we talked about before, getting ahead of it, understanding an escalation path, because Scott, like you said, things are going to go wrong. And the important thing to understand, I think, wherever you sit in this operation is everybody is in peak season. So there's nobody who's sitting around waiting for yep. your call. You know, we're in peak season, your WMS providers are their peak season, the brand <laughs> is the retailer. So it, you really have to have that set beforehand because it, everybody's getting pulled in a lot of different directions. And if you don't understand, hey, if, if I need something right away, where do I go? That has to be done well in advance because, you know, everybody's fighting a lot of fires uh, and you have to be able to, to manage that because every vendor is a little different. There's no set path for how you escalate. Um, and I think that's important to understand. That's that's a call or, a, you know, conversation prior to the, the busy season. And then, Scott, look, to your point, you know, the questions asked, it's like, who are the key people? What are the preferred methods, you know, when that first one doesn't work, where do I go next? Um, and then ultimately, what are the downstream effects of what I'm dealing with? And how do I communicate that to ensure the accurate, appropriate level of, of effort is put onto this problem? Excellent, Wes. Mm -hmm. Love that perspective. Kim, what stood out there in Wes's response? Planning the escalation path is really important. I am a notorious just escalator. I just go straight to C-suite on a time. And a lot of people get upset about that because they're like, if you'd asked, I'm like, but I didn't have time to find you. <laughs> um, so so that's important because they spend a, and I have done hundreds of crises right. that all seem to happen at 2 a.m. I don't know. They can't happen at 2 p.m. They have to happen in the middle of the night. Um, and it is very frustrating. Like, who do we get on the call? How do we get them? How, you know, who do we tell? And especially when you guys are talking about 3PLs, because it has such a great downstream effect, right? right? So we need to, you know, let the store know that their shipment of the product that's launching tomorrow isn't going to be there. And so that they can prepare. So, you know, how do you do that in a seamless way that doesn't wake up the entire company to, to get that information? But yeah, that super uh, clean escalation path will make everything move much faster. Love it. Love it. All right. So, Tony, let's see here. We've been talking about data throughout the conversation. We talked about, of mm -hmm. course, last time we had the one-two punch that is Tony and Wes here with us. So, obviously, it begs the question, how can you leverage data analytics to forecast demand and optimize resource allocation because they are finite? Yeah, excellent. Kim, I think you, you even mentioned this, alluded to this a couple of times. Like, if you look at this year over year, and this is just this is just a kind of demonstration of what we see as a business, which is a really good diversity of industries and product categories and fulfillment models shipped to DC for crosstalking purposes, bulk, and also a lot of e-commerce that's in here as well. And you can see that as quite a few similarities year over year. And it's understanding the nuances inside of each of those months and weeks. And what, what we do as a business is we look at, and our team has gotten so good at this over the years, tons of confidence in our ability, because obviously we go through peak season, like, like Wes was saying too, just like everybody mm -hmm. else. Right. We know where our peaks 
at, like the high water mark in any given 15 minute window, for example, in terms of orders or shipments flowing through our network, but we don't know when that's going to hit. So we'll run simulations to make sure that we can hit those peak of the peaks. I think that that type of preparation is transferable to everyone's business in their own way. Where again, like we, we have a high degree of confidence that it's probably going to happen in the month of November and probably down to the week that it's going to happen. But we don't know if it's going to be Cyber Monday at 8 a.m. Eastern time or right. Black Friday at, you know, whatever. So I think leveraging the data and what you've learned from your business or what your partners like a 3PL if you're a brand have learned from their business to make sure you're prepared is a really important thing to do. And then Waleeb, I really like where you're going too is for, for your customers that are sophisticated in their demand planning, that's another data point that you should be plugging into this as well that can contribute to what you're assuming will be your year over year growth or your mm -hmm. growth in your overall peak. So I just think, mm -hmm. you know, take the time with that data and then use that for your preparation. Excellent point, uh, Tony. I love your perspective. Kim, what would you add to that? Yes, data is huge. And if there's one piece of data that I would, if, if people were like, hey, there's one thing that we're going to look at, your PO data. Yeah. And it's the one thing that nobody looks at, right? Especially in logistics. Once it starts moving, they start to kind of get plugged into it and they're like, oh, it's moving. We care now. No, you need to care when that PO is written because that tells you what's coming six months, three months, 12 months down the road. A good PO will have a no later than ship date. They'll have an expected delivery date. Like all of that data is there to tell you. And that is your buying team's way of saying, here are expectations of you without us telling you what they are. Um, so it is available to you. So PO, 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 PO. Always look at PO data. I love that. So Tony, quick follow-up question. Uh, we, were, we asked Wes earlier about some key questions to ask, right? But for you, Tony, what should we be asking ourselves and our customers when it comes to lead times and, of course, visibility? Your PO thing, I, I love that so much because it's where, where my mind goes with this question is the type of purchase order we're talking about makes a big difference here, right? Like you, to your point, you've got that big wholesale order. Maybe you even know the plan for the entire year so you can plan out the lead times versus a e-commerce order that just just came through as a sales order and you're balancing that as a part of your overall inventory allocation strategy so the best kind of prep sessions and we always say like this time of year for us is an extremely busy time for our onboarding side of our business as well as obviously mm -hmm. reflective of our customers onboarding they're getting that new retailer up and ready to go or that new sales channel up and ready to go and they're obviously juggling the prioritization inside of their business what comes when. I think that really is dictated by when that first purchase order is coming and what the lead time is for me to be prepared on that first purchase order. And those things are going to change, but being really kind of conscious of the fact that every relationship has a nuance based on the type of purchase order or sales orders and the shipping methods that I'm, I'm doing. Uh, but yeah, I, I really like where you went with that, Kim, on the purchase order front, because I think that leads exactly into this lead time in preparation lens. Yes. Every relationship has its own set of nuances, as Tony said. You know, maybe not peanut butter and jelly. That's pretty straightforward these days. Not much nuance there, but that is not the world of globe supply chain. Kim, anything you want to add to, uh, as it relates to Tony's response there? The PO is the secret sauce. Like, I'm just going to tell people right now. Like, I preach it constantly. I've done it. I've built entire import supply chains around starting with PO. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. You don't need to think this far in advance. But let me tell you, if you want a 99% plus pre-clearance and full flow of your inventory, you're going to have to do it. And you can get 99% plus uh, if you do it that way. But, you know, as far as asking your customers in their lead time, like, what are their expectations? Um, and I think another thing that we don't talk to our customers about, especially in the retail space and even in e-commerce, is what are your holiday sales plans? Right. When are you going to start? Are you doing any special events? Da, 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 da. You know, one of the examples of uh, a uh, company I worked with previously, we were doing a big launch for Beyonce when she was doing her um, Ivy workout wear. Beyonce I? Same. Is it Beyonce I? Super Bowl commercial. Y'all saw that, surely, right? No, Beyonce I, yeah. Yes. I did, sorry. It was my favorite one, Kim. 
Beyond uh, AI. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. I was probably too busy doing something else. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, so there's this huge launch around Beyonce, you know, workout gear. The logistics behind that were outrageous to make sure that that happened. And it was the last thing everybody talked about. Right. So nobody really talked about outside of having inventory to show on a shelf. There wasn't a lot of conversation about like, how are we going to support this from the warehouses, the three PLs, what are the expectations? So I think, you know, especially coming into peak season, you know, what are your plans? Are, you know, when are you going to start? Are you having Black Friday? Are you having Cyber Monday? You know, what are you doing? Because that, you know, that there's going to be demand around that. And then another little sort of industry secret is that your logistics and transportation department for your customer, they're negotiating space with the carriers. Yeah. OK, so they have to predict how many orders they think they're going to have around peak season. Mm. So you have these two. We have the buyers who are like, here's how much inventory we think we're going to have and how much we're going to sell. And then you have supply chain that's like, uh, we need to have you know this much capacity with our carriers. These two rarely come together and speak. Mm. But if you got them together, you would have a full picture. Ah, OK. Things we can do with full pictures. And by the way, going back to the earlier part of your response, the products are cool and all. But supply chain makes it happen. Supply chain is the details, as someone I worked with used to say all the time. Um, Wes, let's dial it in. We've really enjoyed a, a, a ton of great conversation. I want to dial it in to how SPS is partnering today to deliver this. What a lot of these things we're talking about all rolls up into a highly streamlined and successful customer experience. How's SPS making that happen, Wes? Yeah, a couple of things. I think number one is a, a focus on the customer. So building an account team around the customer so that, you know, that escalation path is clear. So the, the team they work with is clear um, and they know all the key points um, to be able to get from day one when that customer comes on board all the way through to, you know, when you're shipping orders in Q4 and everybody's running around. And then number two, I think just the architecture, the way we build connections is we do it right. We do end-to-end -end testing for each retailer. We're not taking any shortcuts. We're not doing things, you know, the fastest possible way. In general, we're doing it in a way that's gonna ensure that we're meeting the requirements of that retailer so that we don't find out later that, hey, we skipped a step and now that, that customer is seeing a ton of chargebacks or, or something's happening that's not delivering the orders to them. That That's something that starts with the brand starts with the retailer and, and flows all the way through that supply chain. And if it's not done right, that, that can have massive consequences on the end customer on, on that brand. So it's really making sure you're approaching it the right way. So that foundation is there for Q4. Excellent point, Wes. And Kim, you know, I've rubbed elbows with and, and work in the retail space uh, in a variety of different ways over the course of my career. Retailers don't want to charge, uh, pass along the chargebacks. They'd rather have suppliers that perform really well. That's where they'll make a whole bunch more money and delight their customers. But uh, Kim, any comments on what Wes just shared there? Yeah, I mean, to your point, Scott, like a chargeback is a failure almost. It's a we, we misjudge customer demand or you didn't meet our requirements. Um, well, I guess the customer is RCV. It's a little bit different. But yeah, you want to have, we need everything smooth. If we don't have a good customer experience, like Wes said, if you're not communicating, we're not, we don't have escalation pass, it's not going to be a smooth peak season. And the thing is with peak season is if you have one oopsie, it just takes one, all of it. Like it can take forever to recover from that. And especially yes. during peak season, you never quite get back up completely back in the saddle if you have one oopsie. So yeah, streamlining everything, communication, complete transparency is the only way to do it. Hate to say it. That's an old cliche, but one bad apple can spoil the bunch, right? It's so it really apropos can. here. All right, so Tony, I'm coming back to these nuances you referenced a minute ago with one of our last questions here. And then we've got a really cool, actionable considerations that folks you can take away from this and put in place today that we're going to get from Wes. But before I do, Tony, we were talking about nuances a minute ago. Those nuances of shipping to new retailers, right? What are some important things to keep in mind there, Tony? Yeah, I, first, I would say that the prioritization of new retailers and new sales channels ahead of peak season, if at all possible, is big. Right? Like you don't you don't want to be. And I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to that chargeback conversation because I think, unfortunately, that's how people learn the nuances, right? Ooh. You know, all too often. But 
the sooner you can get the muscle memory, if you will, and get that new channel or new retailer operationalized in your business, either if you're a brand shipping to a retailer for the first time or you're three PL shipping on behalf of your customer to a retailer for the first time. Very, very important. That is not just the technical side of the purchase order, if we will, and some of those pieces, but it's also that business process. You know, you don't want to be, you know, going out and booking freight on a retailer portal for a collect shipment the first time when it's a kind of high impact order, going back to that PO thread that's become a theme here, Kim. Come back to that chargeback thought. It's just all too often we hear from yeah. our customers that like they, hey, we're going to learn about it a month after we've made the mistake. And what would be the absolute worst time to learn of a nuance through a chargeback? Peak season. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Spend the prep up front and then still insulate yourself, if at all possible, with, you know, actually going through the, the strokes of, of doing a shipping for a new channel for the first time before you get into that you know, heart of shipping to a DC in September or shipping dropship on behalf of a retailer come November. So hopefully mm -hmm. lots there and they're all, there's, there's those nuances. You got to understand them, operationalize them. Most of our big three PLs do that up front. And then yes. they've got that all the way attached to the pick, pack and ship process through their WMS instrumented. So that's just an important thing to have flushed out. Hey, give me good news fast, but give me bad news faster. Yeah. That's a mm -hmm. motto of the, uh, the second generation owner of the Vlasic Food Company, right? The son of the founder that took it to incredible heights. That's one of his mantras throughout the decades of running the business. Kim, respond to what Tony was just sharing there about the nuances of shipping to new retailers. Vendor guides are huge. We have to, you know, write it out um, and have it documented on what the requirements are. Yeah, because the chargebacks are crazy. And every retailer has their little tiny thing that they have. It's got to be pink, you know, shrink wrap and, you know, whatever. Like, and, and, and it's really hard to manage. But if you can document them and you can kind of streamline them into the process, it makes a huge difference. Yes, standardization and, and implementing standardization. So the whole team knows, the process knows, mm -hmm. and we can hopefully uh, automate and apply technology to make it easy to hit all of those specs each and every time. Okay, we've got to get into, uh, right before we let Wes and Tony uh, and Kim go, we wrap this episode, there's a couple of final questions. I want to start with this. Wes, a simple, I love simple but proven action plans. So what would you say about some activities folks can take throughout the year that are truly necessary to complete, to really set yourself up for a successful peak season in Q4 in the year? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it starts real early. You know, you start in January, right? It coming out of- Y'all catch that theme? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's all circular and it's all, yeah, it all moves. But I think you spend Q1 looking at, hey, what did we do well? What did we not do well? You know, you're signing on new customers, people who maybe had a bad experience in Q4 with their current provider. Maybe they're anticipating growth, they're looking, but we see a lot of activity there in Q1. And then I, I think really looking at gaps in technology. You know, what, where can we fill some gaps? How can we help facilitate more growth um, next year? You focus on what can I do? Then you move into Q2 and, and Q3. You're, you're onboarding those clients that hopefully you signed on during Q1. Um, you're bringing on that technology, you're finalizing those evaluations, you're kicking off the implementation, really getting in, into those activities that, that help drive it. Um, you have to be done with those early enough, like Tony said, uh, to be able to support that Q4 growth in, in the peak season. And then finally, Q4, you're, you're executing, there's not a lot of time. It's really, let's document what doesn't go well so that we remember um, once the fog of Q4 lifts. You know, we can have ideas, but you're not going to make a ton of changes in Q4. And then I think the, the thing that makes this challenging for logistics companies is you're doing all of this while shipping out a ton of orders because there's no slow season. There's no time when you're just sitting around waiting. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. big in Q4, but we see even last year, you saw in the middle of the year, just that, that yellow line, you see a kind of a, a jump throughout the middle, kind of normally slower season. So there's always a ton of activity. Um, you've got to juggle that with making the right investments, making the right decisions so that when Q4 comes around, you're prepared. Excellent, Wes. And really quick, I, his first suggestion there, folks, 
Don't make assumptions that you think you know what went well and what didn't go. Have those conversations. Don't mail in those postmortem conversations in Q1 to reflect on everything that transpired in Q4. I'm telling you, lean into what Wes, Tony, and Kim were talking about. And that's where big time outcomes can come out of those powerful learning opportunities. Kim, really quick, uh, you want to pick up one of those actionable items that Wes shared? Anything you heard there? So back to the early thing, you know, adding new vendors. One, it's helpful if, you know, in Q1, you can get an idea of how many new vendors or new retailers you may, you know, what are your business goals? What is that? How much are we planning to expand? And then you're prepared for that. Onboarding new retailers, I would love as a person who does this stuff all the time, I would love for it to be a flip of a switch. And we're good. It normally takes like six, eight weeks to kind of get everything running. And so you have to plan ahead. And so that would be my biggest thing, you know. So, you know, when I worked at Amazon, I ran inbound and outbound. We were in peak season from August till like December 25th. And so don't add people in November. That all needs to be done in June, May, June. Love it. Act early, act early, act early. And three other tips, plan, plan, plan. Uh, good stuff there, Kim and Wes and Tony. Hey, we got Kim's key takeaways a little bit early. You're always early and in full, uh, Kim. I love it. Uh, all right, so really quick, Wes and Tony, let's make sure I've got a resource I'm going to share with folks, a cool landing page that will dive deeper into a lot of things we're talking about and some of the cool things SPS is doing. But Wes, how can folks connect with you? Yeah, you can reach out on LinkedIn. Had a couple of people reach out after our last conversation, had some, some good discussions. So feel free to reach out. Awesome. Whether you're talking retail supply chain or 3PL stuff or Lego tips. You can get uh, maybe the plans of how to build a Death Star with Legos from Wes. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, Tony, same question. How can folks connect with you? Definitely the same. Connect on LinkedIn, reach out with a message. Always inter interested to talk supply chain, learn from other folks' experience. So don't be a stranger. Awesome. Y'all connect with Wes and Tony. And hey, connect with Kim Reuter on LinkedIn as well. Good stuff there. Always enjoy her perspective. Hey, Kim, let's share this resource from Wes, Tony, and the team here, folks. If you want to learn more about how 3PLs in particular can accelerate time to revenue with Wes, Tony, and the SPS gang, make sure you connect with Wes and Tony, both from SPS Commerce. Wes Arnson, thanks for being here. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Tony Thrasher, great to have you here today. Likewise. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, you bet. Kim Mortar, really enjoyed your perspective as always today. Thanks for being here. Yep. Here's a challenge. Y'all got to take something that Wes or Tony or Kim shared here today. Going back to, we got to make things easier. We got to change how business is done. 99.999% of our team members want to do world-class jobs, right? And we got to enable them and empower them to do just that. And there's a lot of great been there, done that suggestions in this conversation. So take just one thing, at least folks. Put it in action. Your team is ready to make it happen. And on that note, on behalf of everyone here at Supply Chain Now, Scott Luton challenging you to do good, to give forward, to be the change that's needed. And we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.